High-rise buildings are being built taller, thinner, and with smaller footprints than any prior generation of skyscraper that we have seen in the last 100 years. Most of these falling into a category that they call super tall buildings, which are occupied structures standing taller than 300 meters and shorter than 600 meters. These buildings are cutting edge with both their engineering and their looks. Last month, we talked about one of these infamous buildings at 432 Park Avenue in New York, which is a super tall that was completed just seven years ago, but is already seeing major issues with plumbing, noise, and the electrical systems due to alleged design flaws. In today's video, we are going to talk about how these buildings are being permitted to be built so tall, and why so many of these skyscrapers are being built and then being occupied when the buildings still have not even received their final safety certifications. Allowing occupancy without a final safety certification seems like pretty common practice, especially in New York, and it absolutely blows my mind. So let's get into it, but before we do, just a quick introduction for anyone who's new to my channel. My name is Scott. I'm a real estate developer myself out of Arizona, so here on my channel we cover all things real estate. Don't forget to click the subscribe button down below if you're not already a subscriber because I'm posting new videos every week. Throughout the 20th century, there were only 24 total super tall buildings that existed around the world, with most of them being in the United States in New York, Chicago, and Houston. Fast forward to today, and now there are 170 super tall buildings around the world with 25 of those buildings being in New York alone. I found a pretty nice graphic from this site Visual Capitalist and it shows some of the most prominent buildings that have gone up in the 21st century like the Shanghai World Financial Center, the Burj Khalifa of course, the One World Trade Center, the Shanghai Tower, and the Century Park Tower. You can also see here that the number of skyscrapers completed per year has been going up a lot in the past 20 years, with 26 buildings going up in 2019 and 37 being built in 2020. These buildings are totally redefining the skyline of the cities that they're built in because they're just so much bigger than what was typical for a high rise in the past. This is happening more and more nowadays because it's beneficial for the developer to cram more units onto a tiny single parcel if they can because in the end, in theory, they'll make more money on their project. And then it's beneficial for the buyers of the units in that project because not only do they get to live in a world-class location, but they get views as far as their eye can see. And if they're in a dense city, they get a lot of natural light if they're in one of those upper units. If you look at the New York City skyline nowadays, there's a few prominent buildings that really stand out. There's 220 Central Park South, designed by Robert M. Stern Architects, which stands 70 stories tall in Midtown Manhattan between Broadway and 7th Avenue. Then there's 111 West 57th Street, which is also known as the Steinway Tower. This one sits on the north side of 57th Street on Billionaire's Row and stands 84 stories tall. You've got 157, which is 75 stories tall, also in Midtown Manhattan. This one houses the Park Hyatt Hotel on the lower stories of the tower, and above the hotel are about 100 condo units, many of which face Central Park. And of course, there's 432 Park Avenue, which we talked about in a prior video of mine. This is the 96-story skyscraper ridden with controversy that was designed by Raphael Vinoli with an exterior inspired by a trash can. These are just a few of the super talls that were built in recent years, and you can tell that when buildings are built this tall, they really stand out next to their neighbors. Love them or hate them, these buildings are definitely engineering marvels and it really shows how far we've come as a society since back when we were building pyramids out of rocks. A unique challenge that developers have when they're building a super tall in a city is getting around all of the zoning laws that have existed in that city for a long time. See, for anybody who's not familiar with this process, if you're going to build a building or a structure in any major city, before building that, you're going to need to get approval from the city and sometimes the county to put that building there. The city will already have a bunch of rules outlined for whatever they deem the best use for that land. They're going to restrict you on things like setback, which means how far away your building can be from neighbors or the sidewalk or the street. They're also going to restrict you on things like livable square footage inside and how the building looks from the street. But the last thing the city is going to restrict you on is the building height, which is what the developers are having a hard time with when they're building a super tall structure. One way the developers have been able to build their skyscrapers higher in cities like New York is by inflating their mechanical floors because by the city standards, those mechanical floors don't count towards the building's allowable height. Pretty messed up, but smart on the developer's part because if they build a bunch of those floors as quote unquote mechanical, that means they can build taller, which means they can sell each one of their apartments for more money because they'll have better views. The group that built Central Park Tower apparently did just this. 
They reserved 300 feet towards mechanical space in there, which propped the building up 30 stories taller than it otherwise would have been allowed to be. Before we get into the safety certifications that these buildings are often lacking, first we have to talk about another way that these developers are getting away with building these super tall buildings to begin with, and that is related to being creative with their air rights. If you've never heard of air rights before, air rights are exactly what you think they are. Basically, it's just the right to the empty space or air that sits above a property or parcel. There are height restrictions to how high you can build in New York City, just like we talked about before. And even if developers use that mechanical space loophole, they still might not be able to build as tall as they'd like. Well, this is where air rights come into play because if a proposed building is sitting next to a building that is much shorter than its max potential, the developer is allowed to buy those air rights from the other building and apply them to his own building. To get creative though, sometimes developers need to acquire vacant parcels of land around their project and the air rights of surrounding buildings, then combine all of those air rights in order to get approval to build their super tall structure. Now that we know that super tall construction has been speeding up fast over the past few decades, and we know that developers have several loopholes to be able to build their buildings taller, it should come as no surprise that many of these buildings are getting finished without final safety certifications. What's crazy to me though, is that even without a final safety certification, the developers are still allowed to sell or rent their units, and people are allowed to start moving into the buildings. I don't know about you, but I personally wouldn't want to spend tens of millions or even hundreds of millions of dollars to move into a building that the city technically hasn't deemed safe yet. But there is more to the story, so let's get into that now. First, we need to establish that it is very common for buildings not to get their final safety certification, which means they don't get their final certificate of occupancy. In New York, buildings are granted a temporary certificate of occupancy, also known as a TCO, and that is what gives them the green light to start selling or renting units. The temporary certificate of occupancy is usually good for three months though, and during that window of time, the developer is supposed to address all of the safety concerns then get their CFO so they can finally move on with their life. Well, in New York alone, there's supposedly hundreds of buildings who are still in the process of trying to obtain their CFO, and almost all of the super tall buildings fall into that bucket. Some of the items that these developers need to fix are more minor and cosmetic, but others could lead to serious safety concerns like plumbing or electrical or elevator or sprinkler issues. This guy, Jose Torero, who's the head of the Department of Civil, Environmental, and Geomatic Engineering Engineering said, some fire resistance calculations, for instance, are predicated on much more compartmentalized floor plans, not the open floor plan designs of luxury condos. The answer is, I don't know how safe these buildings are, and nobody does, he said. Nobody really knows what they're truly approving. That is really scary to think, but it does make sense because developers are testing new engineering methods as we speak, as they try to cram these massive structures onto postage stamp size lots. This is definitely a win-win situation though between the developers and the city, because the developers are building structures that sometimes cost north of $2 billion. Then the city ends up benefiting from massive revenue once these structures are built. The Real Deal reported last month that only three of the cities 25 tallest residential towers have completed safety tasks as outlined by the Department of Building. And they also went on to share that the Times found many of these issues are on Billionaire's Row buildings, which is called Billionaire's Row for a reason. It is considered the height of residential luxury in the city. As a real estate developer myself, I've only done a couple of what I would consider luxury deals, but I did learn a few things from the buyers of those multi-million dollar homes, and that is that they are very picky and very sophisticated. So it blows my mind that there's billionaires from all over the world who are willing to spend all this money on these apartments in these buildings that don't have their final C of O due to safety concerns. But I guess sometimes when you've got that much money, you're just looking for somewhere to park it. By the sound of things, there are engineers, city planners, and residents who are all starting to bring these issues to light. And as a result, I think that we will see the development of these super tall buildings slow down in the coming years. While it doesn't appear that any of these buildings are at risk of anything super catastrophic like a collapse, it still would be devastating if they face something like a flood or a fire. My hope is that we continue to innovate in terms of the engineering of these structures and that we tighten up the process of delivering a CFO on the buildings prior to the residents moving in. That'll make it to where we don't have any more stories like we do right now at 432 Park where the residents are suing the developers for $250 million due to building issues. If you enjoyed the video today, guys, if you could hit the like button down below before you go, that would really help me out a lot. And I know I say it every time, but 
but don't forget to click subscribe as well if you're not already a subscriber because I'm posting new videos every week and I'd love to have you here for next one. But that's all I've got for you guys this time. So until next time, see ya.